Welcome. Welcome everybody to the HPC Best Practices webinar series. This series is brought to you by the IDEAS Productivity Project with funds from the Exascale Computing Project. And the series is also collaboration between the, the uh, various the Argonne Oak Ridge and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories. I'm Osni Marcus from Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Ashley from Oak Ridge and I will be the hosts for today's webinar, Building Community Through Act Access DK software policies. And the webinar will be presented by Rick and Meyer, uh, Meyer Young from Lawrence Livermore National Lab and Peter Luzek from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. They'll talk a little more about themselves when the webinar starts. We have sold plus uh, more than 120 tickets for this webinar, and all attendees have been muted by default. Uh, we'll be receiving questions through the WebEx chat and also the Google Doc. We have pasted those addresses in the chat of the WebEx. And the webinar will have a break so the speaker can respond, the speakers can respond to the questions that come in. And with that, Rika, uh, I start. Thank you. Okay, let me share my content here. Okay. All right. Um, welcome, everybody, and thank you, Osni and um, Ashley, for inviting us and giving us this opportunity to talk about our um, community policies. Um, XSDK, by the way, stands for Extreme Scale Scientific Software Development Kit. And before I get into the actual meat of this, um, I want to introduce us first. So who are we? Um, we are actually developers of um, a variety of high-performance math libraries. Um, Piotr Luszczek, he is a performance engineer and developer for various numerical libraries and benchmarks, and you can see them over here on the right side, HPC, G, HPL, Magma, and Plasma, and he's also a member of the XSDK4 ECP project, which, as you might have guessed, is a development of the XSDK within the ECP. Um, my name is Ulrika Mai Young. I'm from uh, Lawrence Livermore National Net, and I have had more than 30 years of experience in all kinds of numerical methods parallel algorithms, scientific software development. I'm the PI of the XSDK4 ECP project, and I'm also a, a software developer for um, Hyper, which is a parallel net solvers library with specific focus on multi grid methods. So why are we leading this webinar? Um, for once, we would like to tell you about the whole story. What is it about the XSDK software policies? Um, we do want to tell you what's the actual reason. Why are they important? Um, how they improve software quality, um, they help with the sustainability of the actual libraries um, because we are having a bunch of math libraries behind it. And very importantly, um, that you can use them in the, together. After all, they are independently packages and um, making sure they are working together is very important, um, specifically within the um, ECP, but in general for all application codes that use a variety of different math libraries. We do also want to dive deeper into the actual policies to see how they are defined. And I should mention these are the ones which we specifically defined for the XSDK. Um, other um, projects who have a variety of software products might want to define different ones, but um, those are the ones that were important to us. And um, again, we'll talk about their impact as well as on software packages as well as the application code. And now, I'm not, my thing doesn't move. Okay, so sorry about that. So who are you? Um, I'm assuming, we are assuming that you are from the, maybe from the extreme scale computational science community. You might be developers of applications or other packages and tools. You might be project leaders, stakeholders, program managers, others. Um, so we're trying to provide something for everybody. Um, our learning objectives are that we would like you to understand why are the software policies important, um, what did it take to actually develop them, what does it take to get people to accept them and use them, and what are they actually about, and finally, what has the impact been. So the quick outline here is first we start with um, the introduction, which um, we are 
pretty much through already. Um, we will talk about uh, what motivated us and the history behind the XSDK as well as the policies for the XSDK. And then Piotr will give a deep dive into the actual community software policies with including some examples. And I will summarize it at the end and say a few words about the impact. So getting to the XSDK history, actually this whole thing started in 2014. There was an original project called IDEAS which stands for Interoperability, Interoperability Design of Extreme Scale Application Software. And uh, it was a partnership between two different programs, the ASCAR and the BER programs, um, which were led by program managers Bayer and Lesmes on the BER side and, and Fetter on the ASCAR side. Um, it was really new in a way um, that the focus was really on trying to make sure that productivity and sustainability of software was a uh, an important um, factor of this whole project, which was different from others in the past, where BR would maybe focus more on the science and ask more on the development of all kinds of types of methods. But this was really focused on trying to do the best job we could do to get good software, sustainable software. Um, uh, to allow to get better scientific productivity, as well as um, see what we can do with extreme scale computing and use a new interdisciplinary and agile approach to the scientific software ecosystem. So this actually followed a workshop which um, had been done before and on the right side of the slide you see a little picture of a report that came out of that um, workshop. And the overall objectives were trying to figure out um, trends in hardware and work towards the increasing demands that we are seeing by um, having ever more complicated um, application codes, which want to simulate bigger and harder things. Also seeing that the hardware was getting more and more complicated, having more heterogeneous type of computer architectures and so on, which requires um, math libraries to continually try to refactor their software, trying to make sure they work efficient, they are efficient on these new architectures and try to continue to improve the software design and come up with good ways to be able to continue to do that and produce high quality software. Um, so specifically for the IDEAS project, um, there were on the BER side um, various use cases, terrestrial ecosystem use cases, which were really important um, that came out of these two science focus areas mentioned here. Um, we look particularly to some kind of subsurface modeling and things like that and um, that were considered. And um, so the approach was here trying to make sure that um, you were able to perform these simulations, um, but also work on, on the ASCA side more on some cross-cutting methodologies and metrics that can have some real impact on the application and programs. Um, the overall team was multi, was interdisciplinary. As you can see here, there were seven different national labs involved in it, and the original leads on the ASCA side were Michael Rue from Sandia National Lab and Louis Kirkman McInnes from Argonne National Lab, and on the BR side, David Moulton from Los Alamos. Um, and we were trying to put three different communities together. Um, there was science, there was scientific productivity, um, there were also the the math libraries, the actual software. So um, there were these three um, different areas, as you can see. On the one on top, you see the use cases. Then there were the methodologies. We were trying to define what does this actually mean to achieve the software productivity. And then there was the actual software product, the XSDK, which consisted out of a variety of different math libraries. So as we were diving into the methodologies part, we were trying to um, define all these different um, components. And so here's a definition of a software library. I'm assuming most of you know what a software library is. Um, it is generally a high quality encapsulated, documented, tested, and multi-use software collection that allows to give specific functionalities to the application people. So they don't have to worry about implementing all these things themselves. So all they need to know is the interface, and the rest is really up to the developers. And the advantage of this is that it really helps the complexity is left within the, in the library. The application user doesn't have to worry about it. Um, 
and that helps to reduce generally um, the coding effort. It also helps to share the code and eases the distribution of code if it's all done right. So um, looking at why reusable scientific software important is looking at the user perspective. Uh, it is important because it allows them us to reuse algorithms and the data structures which they don't have to worry about. Experts will take care of that. Um, they, um, they, can, they don't have to cope with the actual underlying complexities. Again, that's left up to the developers um, that have to do this. On the um, provider perspective, it allows them to have a wider impact because after all, if we generate a software package, it's nice to see people are using it uh, and that it makes an impact over there. It also helps to give us new ideas on what we actually should put in our code. So there is this nice um, uh, communication between software provider as well as software users. And overall, it leads to get better, more efficient, robust, reliable, um, and also sustainable software. Because after all, when people are using it, they will possibly run into bugs, we'll fix them, we give them better options, and so on. Um, so that helps our productivity, but it also helps the scientists to generate overall better science since they don't have to worry about the math algorithms underneath. So software libraries are great, but of course, they are not enough. And um, any of you who are application users know that you might need a lot of different libraries together. So it is really important that software packages um, can be used together. And of course, like Steve Jobs he had to say, the way you get programmer productivity is by eliminating lines of code you have to write. Um, in other words, if you're an application user, it's good for you to use a software library so you don't have to write that portion yourself. As a matter of fact, different applications have tended to put their own solvers, their own things into their application, but again, um, there's no need for that if there's a well-working library and it helps overall productivity. So, however, when we actually start looking at independently developed software libraries, um, then the question becomes, how are they actually working together? And it turns out that you're now working with an ecosystem and that's very challenging. Like Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington said, we often think that when we have completed our study of one, we know all about two because two is one and one. We forget that we still have to make a study of and. And that's essentially what the access decay is about, the and. How can we make sure that all our great math libraries that have been independently developed are building well together so application users don't have to deal with all the stresses that come, go along with that? So here's actually the overall extreme scale scientific software ecosystem that we were um, looking into. On top, you have the extreme scale science applications, which have some interfaces to domain components, which can be some small physics um, pieces like reacting flow that are reusable, um, doing some kind of multi-scale, multi-physics coupling. Then, of course, the interfaces to the individual libraries, which can be solvers, um, a mesh kind of system, things like that, um, and so on. There are also other code and data objects. Um, there is, of course, documentation and testing as well as building content. So we have a frameworks and tools underneath, and there's finally the software engineering um, portion. So on the bottom, you see the part that the actual XSDK is consists of domain components and libraries as well as different frameworks and tools as well as software engineering portions. Um, so one of the difference, difficulties that happen when you deal with a variety of independently developed software packages is that you can run into all kinds of issues when you try to compile them together, as I assume any applications user has encountered. You might end up having inconsistent compiler versions, you use different packages, might use different, the same packages underneath, but different versions. There could be namespace conflicts um, and all kinds of things. And on top of it, if you have libraries that actually interoperate, you might have additional issues. 
So we actually defined the levels of package interoperability here. There are three different levels. On first level is you just want to use packages side by side in an application. Even then, you can already have problems. Um, in the second case, you have libraries that exchange data with each other, and that makes the interoperability even more complicated. And finally, you have the situation where one library calls another for to perform certain computations. And all these interoperabilities need to be taken into account and need to make sure that this all works well together. So that's the overall um, motivation behind when we started to put the XSDK together is that uh, you need to be able to use these independent packages together. On the right side, you see this little diagram, and you see the original four math libraries that were included in the IDS project were just Trilinos, Petsy, Hyper, and SuperLU. Um, but even with those few libraries, and at that time we also had some domain components like um, Pflotrim, Alchemia, even at that level, we already had problems to try to make them all work together in context with the, the use cases we had from VR. So before we started this whole effort, it was not easy at all to try to build one single executable because there were various incompatibilities we had to take care of first. So the question then is, what can you do to avoid these problems I just mentioned? So what we started to do is we started to ask application developers for feedback on what are the most important issues you encounter, what can we do. We also had various brainstorming sessions with um, our software developers. As I said, Ideas was a huge project um, who had all kinds, who really understand software and understand what are the, the things we, what we can do. How can we um, avoid these issues when we deal with these different libraries? So we collected the input. And then we formulated a set of rules that really helped us to avoid these issues, which we call the XSDK standards. And um, I should say, um, when we decided to have these rules, um, these were specifically focused on the XSDK. Um, other people might decide to have different um, standards or rules um, that make sense for them, but just keep that in mind. So then after we had our rules and our XSDK, as we call them, standards together. The question was, what are we going to do next? Obviously, now we have to get to tell people about these new rules and get them to accept them so they can actually include them in their codes. So we started this by giving, communicating our um, policies in, in various venues. We talked at meetings. We had papers. Um, we just made sure people started to know about this. One thing we found right away, you need to use the right vocabulary. That's very important. Originally, we, we asked people to be compliant to XSDK library standards, and somehow that um, formulation didn't fly very well. Um, and we also asked for minimum compliance requirements and recommended re compliance. And so we realized we had to change our vocabulary, and we used a new formulation, the one that you know by now. We replaced the standards or requirements by the word community policies, and we were, replaced the word compliance by compatibility. And that sort of changed the focus. We also made sure that we gave a lot of opportunity for people to give input, so they had um, a stake on this whole thing that they felt like they contributed to that. And all this helped to get quite a few of um, projects to become part of it. The second part is once you have these um, policies, you also want to make sure that they, are, they stay around because, and it's important that they kept alive. Um, so what we are doing now to make sure that happens, we continue to ask for input from the community. Like this is on the right side, you see this. is something you might find often on our slides because we do want to have feedback. We also have a web page here people can go to. Um, we also make updates towards our community, so they're not frozen. Um, since we do know software practices are changing, computers are changing, um, software is changing, um, it's important to make sure that we stay up to date on this. And so we have regular XSDK community policy releases, which we usually have some a little bit before we do an actual XSDK release to go the, make them go hand in hand. And we also provide a process that allows this change. 
Um, we also, besides at the accessdk.info webpage, we also provide the community policies on GitHub, and there is a way you can do pull requests to change, add policies, or you can leave comments also on GitHub, and so they can be incorporated in the future. So after we've done all this, we had our very first XSDK release was in April 2016, 0.1.0. As you can see at that time, as I mentioned before, we had only four math libraries, Petsy, Hyper, Super, Leo, Linux. Um, we had one domain component at that time, Alchemia. Um, we, at that time, we had 14 mandatory XSDK community policies and five recommended community policies. Um, and uh, at that time, we also had an XSDK installer, which was going through Petsy. Um, and the arrows between those uh, green libraries here um, show the interoperabilities between the different libraries. So the last release, um, which was just last month, three years later, um, 0.5.0, you can see the amount of our libraries has significantly increased. Um, we do now have 21 math libraries and two domain components. We have 16 mandatory XSDK community policies and seven recommended ones. Um, and you don't see any errors here anymore, but on the next slide I will show you the complication, how complicated it's actually become, the interoperabilities. To see here, this is the XSDK dependency graph. Um, you can see the green ones are all the different libraries. Black ones are libraries that um, they depend on, so additional libraries underneath. And so you see, this is overall highly complicated, and if we wouldn't have all these rules to be able to build all this correct, it would be very difficult to handle that. So at this point, I just wanted to stop and see if there are any questions. Not at this point, Ulrika. Please continue. Okay. So um, I will hand this over to Piotr then, who will start deep diving into the community policies. And as he's presenting this, please keep in mind that these are specifically for the XSDK and other uh, projects. I mean, you might not agree with all of them for a different project that you have. Okay, uh, thank you, Ulrike. Uh, this is uh, Piotr Luszczek. Uh, we're going to move on into uh, uh, the next part of the presentation, which includes the uh, the deep dive into the uh, community software policies uh, that um, they were established uh, over the years. So, uh, moving on to the uh, uh, mandatory policy number one, M1 for short, um, uh, we ask for compatibility to support uh, autoconf or CMake options during the configuration, installation, and build of the uh, of the packages. These options are described in the uh, se separate document, and you can see the link uh, right here at the top of the slide. And I will go uh, through them uh, uh, briefly on the next slide. The, uh, the the actual use of AutoConv and CMake is optional and not required, and a good example of that is Patsy that uses uh, Python uh, configure for configuration, but most of the options are compatible with XSDK, and Patsy is part of the, um, uh, the XSDK uh, release. Uh, make, file on make file only builds are not allowed, and some packages had to adjust before they joined XSDK. One of them was Plasma that introduced CMake-based configuration and build. And also SuperLU transitioned also from make-based builds with uh, configuration stored in the make.ink uh, file. And uh, that actually helped them to develop some uh, architecture and optimization options, as well as introduce multiple versions of the, of the library. And other packages that, as they became part of XSDK, such as Sundials, they had to realign the configuration options. And uh, for some of the options, they actually uh, duplicated the functionality so they could support the uh, options uh, <clears throat> mandated by XSDK and the options that they had for the users that were with them already before they joined XSDK. Moving on to, the, uh, to those uh, XSDK installation policies, there are 13 of them. And so this is just a brief um, uh, overview. Uh, 
uh, number one is uh, is option to enable or disable the XSDK defaults for all the all the options uh, from two to thirteen. Number two is the prefix option that allows to specify the uh, path and location in the file system where the package is supposed to be installed. Number three is a set of options for specifying the compilers such as C, C++, Fortran, as well as the options for the uh, for the linker. Uh, and the preprocessor. Number four uh, selects the different kinds of builds of the package, either uh, a debug version or a release version. Number five enables or disables the uh, build of, uh, of shared libraries. Number six is for enabling and disabling specific uh, uh, languages or interfaces to the languages in the package. Number seven deals with the uh, floating point precision. Uh, we suggest to at least support single, double, and quadruple precision. Number eight uh, specifies the uh, index sizes for indexing the arrays and matrices and vectors, either 32 or 64 bit. Number nine allows to, uh, the user to specify the uh, um, what kind of uh, BLAS and LAPAC libraries uh, the package should use. Number 10 is for enabling options that are specific to uh, uh, to the package, enabling uh, functionality, enabling external packages that the uh, uh, that, that that could be used when when installing and building the package. Number eleven, uh, we specify that setting up the uh, LD library path uh, should not be the something that the package uh, would rely on. So that, for example, runtime uh, runtime path libraries in the binaries should be set uh, with uh, during the installation and build. Number 12 uh, uh, requires that um, uh, that there are stages in the, during the uh, configuration, installation, and build, such as uh, compile the package, install the package, being able to test it, and uh, and test the install if, if it was successful. And finally, uh, number 13 is uh, we'd like for the package to provide its its the details of its provenance, uh, meaning uh, what it uh, what it configuration was used, what the libraries and packages were used during the, the configuration installation, and those should be used and uh, provided in machine readable form so that um, uh, other packages can programmatically look into that and uh, and see what uh, what they uh, what options they have available. So moving on to mandatory policy uh, number two, uh, uh, we uh, require for compatibility that uh, a test suite, uh, the test suite should not require commercial software. It should be of a reasonable size, so it should complete in a, on a workstation uh, within a few hours or potentially less, and should also be suitable for running in batch-only environments. And the, uh, as the packages were joining XSDK, they, they made adjustments to do that, and uh, and to their test suite, and they actually have a uh, quite different um, uh, set of things that they test uh, uh, in, that, in, in their test suite. So for DL2, uh, the test suite uh, tests the interfaces that DL2 has with other libraries. In, um, in Hyper, uh, the, the errors, error checking was introduced for uh, various platform specific things. In, uh, in MFEM, that also includes other sub packages for, for functionality. The versioning of the of the sub packages is very important, so that's what the test with uh, checks. Petsy Tower introduced uh, new features in parallelism when they joined XSDK for for robustness of the and scalability of the testing. Uh, SuperLU introduced a full featured uh, regression test suite, and now they can run the test suite in the in the uh, continuous uh, integration pipeline. Uh, for for every comment that goes in their repository, and Trilinos also regularized their test suite for compatibility and testing the interfaces with Hyper and and Petsy. Moving on to the uh, mandatory policy number three, uh, uh, we require for compatibility that there we should that the packages will not directly use MPI com world um, in the in the code. So uh, only the user provided communication. Uh, should be allowed, uh, or, or the communicators that the user defines and passes directly into the packet. It is possible and, and allowed to uh, uh, compile and install the version of the package that is sequential, 
However, uh, in, in such cases, the packages are not allowed to uh, basically have a, a scaled down version of MPI that only has a, a single rank in, in the communicator because the package can potentially be mixed with other packages that are compiled in a parallel way, but we don't want the name clashes. So if such a limited functionality is provided, it should be namespaced in, to, the, to the package specifically. And so uh, some of the packages have to make adjustments to comply that as they join XSDK. Moving on to the uh, mandatory policy number four, uh, we'd like the, for the packages to be portable uh, across uh, most common platforms. We test XSDK uh, across uh, Mac OS and uh, variants of, of Linux. Uh, so the packages should, uh, should also look into that, as well as the uh, major DOE sites or we test and make sure that the XSDK works properly. So the portability on this platform is also requested in this, in this policy. Uh, the compilers that we, uh, with, with, that we ask to, to use or test are uh, LLVM and GNU for the uh, open source compilers, but, uh, but also the vendor uh, compilers are important, uh, especially on, on some of the machines that, uh, that require those vendor compilers to unlock the low level hardware features. And, um, and the packages joining XSDK had to adjust to, to comply with this policy. For example, the FIST package uh, had to do away with some of the hardware-specific OpenMP and dash MR uh, options uh, just to be portable across, uh, across various platforms. And policy, mandatory policy number five, uh, asks for, a, uh, for providing a reliable contact information for the package. Uh, either a web form or email are required, and we specifically say that joining mailing lists uh, for reporting bugs is, is not enough for this policy because the mailing lists usually are not very well focused and, um, and they would require user to, uh, to scan uh, specifically for, for their own bug among all the other bugs and issues that are reported on the mailing list. In the mandatory policy number six, um, we asked uh, the packages to respect the system resources and, and settings. Uh, a good example for this, since a lot of packages are a numerical, uh, require numerical computation are, so the floating point exceptions are important. So we asked that the packages, if they choose to change the floating exception mode, floating point exception mode, that they, um, that they reset that setting uh, upon exit. And uh, if it's not possible to change the setting, we also ask the packages to provide a programmatic way to, to, uh, to prohibit the changing of the setting so the user can keep, uh, keep their uh, uh, settings and resources in a very specific state if the user chooses to. In mandatory policy number seven, uh, we ask for a permissive uh, open source license. So an example are MIT or a three close BSD uh, license. Uh, a strong copyleft licenses such as GPL are explicitly uh, prohibited and not compatible. Uh, uh, on the other hand, the weak copyleft licenses such as L LGPL or GPL version 2 with runtime exception are uh, accepted but, um, but re reserve the right to, uh, uh, of uh, accepting these packages with these weak copyleft licen licenses in the future. And uh, we explicitly prohibit the restriction of, of commercial use. And also worth noting is that using this copyleft licensing is uh, frowned upon in the, uh, in the industry. And for some packages such as Trilinos, the issue was not really the license itself, but it was the licensing of the packages that Trilinos needed for its functionality. So, uh, so it's sometimes worthwhile to look at the, uh, the licensing of the code, the not that it's just written for the package specifically, but the code that has been included from, uh, from other libraries or, or packages. Okay, uh, in uh, mandatory policy number eight, um, we ask that the version information is available at runtime. So if, uh, if XSDK includes a regular, regular release of a package, a full version information should be inclu included through a simple and um, and, uh, and uh, easy to find uh, API call, so the user can know exactly which, uh, uh, which uh, version of the package is linked in into the executable. For the in-development uh, versions of, uh, of XSDK or the packages, uh, we ask to include the commit ID in, the, uh, in this version information. 
Uh, and as a useful add-on to this is that the options for configuring and, and building the package should also be included so the, uh, the user can ask for these, uh, for these uh, when, they, um, when they include the package in their, in their software. Because it is really hard to track versions of, uh, of all the dependencies, uh, we now use SPAC for, for tracking that and that became a very, uh, very, very much manageable because uh, SPAC takes care of the entire dependency tree and, and, uh, and that the information is immediately available to, uh, to the user of, of packages. In policy number nine, uh, we, yet, we ask that the, uh, the, there's a namespace provided for all the externally visible artifacts, such as uh, uh, macros, uh, symbols, uh, library names, and header, header files. So uh, as a good example, here is the matrix class, which a lot of packages have that. And, and for each package, it would probably mean something different what a matrix is. So we ask that each package uh, either prefixes it with the package name or includes it in the, in the namespace, as in, in the case in C++. And also some uh, uh, additional macros that the package might be using, such as uh, has long long, also need to be uh, prefixed, especially if they go into the publicly available headers for the, for the Plasma library. And uh, this namespacing caused some issues along the way. Um, some of macros were not prefixed in DL2, so they had to be fixed. Um, and in hypers, uh, fu there were functions that were that needed the hyper pre prefix. And in Plasma library, before it joined XSDK, it had entire separate library with functions that were uh, without any prefix. So now both the library and the symbols inside have a Plasma prefix. In um, uh, in Sundial, the, uh, some of the uh, uh, integrators and non-linear non solvers uh, that were in, uh, interfaced with MFEM had to be updated for namespacing. And finally, in SuperLU, namespacing allowed to actually combine all different versions in SuperLU in a single build. And so that's, that kind of already showed the benefits of, of using namespaces for the symbols. Uh, moving on to a policy number 10 uh, that asks for the use of version control for development. We do not require that the, the repository is public, but at least would like to have an access for, uh, for the XSDK team members. Uh, we do recommend that uh, the repository or the site supports a pull request because it's a much easy way, a very easy way to uh, support fast development and collaboration between the teams. Majority of the XSDK packages right now use Git. Some use Mer Mer Mercurial. Uh, during, upon joining of XSDK, SuperLU transitioned from SVN to JIT, to Git, and that allowed them to, uh, to take pull requests, uh, use uh, distributed development, and, uh, and, and enable uh, builds on, on Windows and with static or dynamic libraries. And for Magma and Plasma that right now use Bitbucket, uh, there is a transition happening to Git because uh, the Mercurial uh, uh, was, uh, was, was being, is being sunset on the, on the Atlassian platform. Moving on to policy number 11, uh, we require no hardwired print or other IO in, in the packet. So if there is any printing or uh, input output in the, in, in the library or the package, we ask that it could be uh, programmatically disabled uh, by the user and doing it to an environment variable is not uh, sufficient because the user sometimes cannot reliably control all the environment variables when the package is being initialized. Um, we also ask that the user uh, be able to redirect the output to, to a stream uh, uh, of, of their choosing. And if the package prints in, uh, in, in parallel builds, then the printing should be limited to rank zero. Um, uh, even though uh, uh, the printing statements in many applications uh, recognize that uh, debugging through print statements is a common practice, we ask that they will be disabled. And in the packages that joined XSDK over time, such as Hyper and, and Pumi, some of these things uh, have to be changed and, and other the, the different levels of reporting were introduced as in Hyper, or the uh, uh, about 700 calls to printf or, or the use of IO stream in C++ had to be dealt with, with, with wrapping, so that could be disabled by the, by the user. In policy number 12, we required uh, the use of external dependencies. 
So if the package uh, asks to uh, we have certain functionality provided by an external package and chooses to include a copy of that package internally, we also ask that that package should be also enabled with, uh, uh, and, and used if it's available already on the, on the system. Uh, and uh, there, are, uh, there are many ways of, of including software if the package chooses to be more, more self-contained and um, uh, namespacing the, the entire package into the uh, into the namespace uh, is 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 one way of dealing with that. Uh, and, and examples of 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 this uh, of this kind of uh, functionality is is when packages use only a subset of Blast or LA Pack, and it include the verbatim copies of these of these libraries. If if they do so, uh, we ask that they be namespaced. So if other package as part of XSDK links against Blast or LA Pack, there will be no name clash. And in Trilinos, there was an issue with some early versions of Boost Any or in Sparse Suite uh, that, that were changed and uh, included in Trilinos in, the, in a separate namespace, so they would not clash with the external copies. Uh, and this does not apply to the hardware hardwired dependencies. For example, in Magma, the hardware acceler accelerators are required, and so the um, so that is that, that does not uh, apply to this uh, this policy. Moving on to policy number uh, 13, uh, we ask to, uh, to honor the prefix for installation. So the option we already talked about was the dash dash prefix, and that allows the, uh, either the system administrators or, uh, or automated and package management systems such as SPAC to put the, uh, the library and, and header files in any place of the, of the file system. Uh, and uh, we also ask in this policy that the version numbers should not be included with the uh, uh, with the headers or, or the libraries, unless uh, unless we uh, we do it for the um, uh, dynamic libraries that the so names such as the examples here where the minor and major and patch levels are included in the uh, uh, library name. Uh, next, the uh, uh, the policy number fourteen we require that the uh, uh, we, we will ask that the uh, by default the 64-bit uh, pointers are are built with the package, and 32-bit pointers are only built um, uh, optionally. Uh, in the uh, policy uh, number 15, uh, we ask that the compatibility with the, uh, all the other policies is sustainable. So that means that the package cannot just uh, put some changes in in a in, in the branch. And, and leave it there while the release versions of the package do not contain uh, the compatibility changes, so the release versions are not compatible. We also ask that the, com the compatibility with the policies is, is maintained and is part of the, uh, of the regular re release process. And so, in other words, uh, the occasional fixes to the package uh, are, uh, are not sufficient to be compatible with the, uh, with the policies. An example of that is that the changes that happened to the release process of Trilinos that made the testing uh, of these policies part of the, uh, the, the test suite. Um, and uh, finally, the last uh, mandatory policy number uh, 16, we asked for the production quality install process. So we talked a lot about what happens, uh, what options are used. But right now, as of um, XSDK version 0 0.2 uh, alpha, uh, we use XSDK. So that may, uh, make sure that, that we have the installation that works in, in the production matter and is uh, applicable in production environments. So before I move to the um, to the recommended policy, maybe I should ask if there were uh, if there are any questions so far uh, about these policies. Yes, there are three questions here. Okay. Uh, so mandatory mandatory policy number four, slide twenty seven. What is the procedure to get access to DOE machines for testing candidate packages on the DOE environments? For example, do we request it through Exceed? Yes. So, um, so there are various programs that allow access to uh, to DOE machine. I'm not really uh, a, an, an expert on that, but yes, Exceed and the Inside programs and there are there are ways of uh, uh, applications uh, and and packages to to access those. A another way, of course, is to contact the XSDK developers directly 
and uh, and we often test the packages uh, before they they join XSDK. Yes, my under, so just to complement, I think uh, I think all facilities have so, some sort of startup accounts. I know that NERSC does, <laughs> for example. For yes, that would also be a good way to do that. So next question, uh, Peter. So uh, mandatory number eight, number eight, can version information be provided via a macro or need it be an actual function call? Uh, yes, so uh, that's, that's an often asked questions. It's a very good one. So if, the, if there's only a, a macro available, the macro does not apply to the, uh, to the libraries uh, that, that are on, on the system. And sometimes there might be issues between the headers that are being included and between the libraries that are being linked. So as part of this policy, it is explicitly required to have a function call in the library and have the version information literally inserted in, in the source code and put in an object file and inserted in the library. So yes, it has to be a function call. So then the next mandatory, the next slide, uh, number nine. So how do you ensure the namespace prefixes are unique across the ecosystems? Simply prepending an arbitrary string with underscore does not create global uniqueness. It's uniqueness. Yes, that, that that is correct. So um, so what we what we're trying to to do is is have unique names of the packages, and those are uh, are used as um, uh, as as the prefixes. So within the scope of the XSDK and uh, and and the community that we work in, so far these these were sufficiently sufficiently unique. I, I don't think we uh, we so far had a, a, any issues or even discussion to use anything more globally identifiable. For example, like uh, like we have for Java packages. So uh, so yeah. that's kind of like uh, the fact that we're working within this particular community that these names end up being uh, unique as long as we prefix them with the with the package name. So maybe I can just say one comment here because we had one situation where somebody suggested a namespace that was like three letters and really not unique, and we asked them to use a different one and they did so. It's still related to this question here. I think that the, the participant just typed. Have you considered a central registry of pref prefixes? Not that I know of, no. Okay, so then the last question I think for this part here. For mandatory number 13, is there a CMake equivalent of that policy? Uh, is there a CMake equivalent? Yes, so there is a CMake prefix that I talked on the slide with the installation pro, uh, policies that um, they would direct the files to a, to a specific location. I don't, uh, I did not include it in the slides, but uh, that would have to be, uh, they can be looked up to one of the XSDK packages, how they deal with this. Well, yeah, the you, answer is it's available, you, just don't know the details from the top of, from the top of my head. You can do that afterwards when you go through the questions and answers and sanitize them. Okay. okay, so uh, please move to the uh, recommended. Okay, so uh, the recommended policy number one, and kind of goes back to the mandatory one that required the source code repository. Here we suggest that to make the repository uh, public so everybody can see the interactions and uh, and, uh, and and see where, where their uh, particular requ requests were uh, approved. And again, we repeat the uh, the and the recommendation of using pull requests because they are very focused and require and allow quick exchange of um, of code and, and faster development. Uh, recommended, I'm sorry, the wrong direction. Recommended policy number two, we uh, uh, we suggest to use the debugging tools uh, while running the test suite. Uh, so the bulk grind is an example of a, of a, a known, uh, well known uh, debugging tool. Uh, it checks for memory co uh, corruptions and uninitialized um, memory locations, among other things, but it causes a slowdown. So uh, if um, uh, if uh, if the developers of a particular package think of a valve grind when, when designing the test suite and, and then design with the slowdown in mind, then the users will be able to run the test suite with valve grind and, uh, and make sure that, uh, that there are no issues there. Uh, moving on to recommended policy number three, 
uh, we ask to have the error reporting consistent and configur configurable uh, across the entire package. So uh, uh, we ask that the other the uh, functions return error codes or they propagate exceptions. Um, there should be ability, ability for the user to programmatically uh, in, uh, change the, the mode of error reporting. For example, for production runs, the user would likely uh, just enable a silent treatment of, of return codes. Uh, whereas for debugging, the user might, support, uh, might, uh, might ask to have the any error cause immediate, uh, immediate uh, abort and so that the debugger can be uh, initiated and the problem can be found. It is explicitly pro prohibited to have calls to abort, exit, MPI abort uh, unconditionally. So again, it's possible to do it as long as there is a programmatic way to switch it on and off by default. Um, and there should be no unconditional printing. We talked about it in the mandatory policies, but during error handling, that is also prohibited. Um, the documentation for the errors should be clear. And we suggest some classes of errors, such as uh, recoverable errors, uh, errors causing resource loss, or errors leaving the process in undefined behavior. Uh, and uh, it's, it's up to the calling code then to, to see which class the error belongs to and deal with it appropriately. Moving on to the recommended policy number four, uh, we ask to release the system resources as soon as possible. Examples of those are uh, open files, the heap memory, or MPI data types or communicators. This ensures the, uh, that there is no gradual exhaustion of resources when we run and scale it for, for a long period of time. And then any resource that is not uh, going to be uh, freed by the package, but has to be freed by the user themselves, that has to be clearly uh, documented. And again, going back to the uh, first, uh, second policy, Valgrain is a useful way of, of dealing with those leaks. In recommended policy number five, we ask the packages export an ordered list of, uh, of their dependencies. Here is uh, some uh, kind of a uh, made up list of, of libraries that constitute C++ or, or LAPAC with different versions and implementations. So that is very useful for the, uh, for the other packages that, that rely. Uh, uh, on, on, on the XSDK package to know uh, what, uh, how to link and which dependencies include in the, in the link line. Uh, in the recommended policy um, number six, uh, uh, we ask that there is a, a clear documentation of the, of the versions of suitable de uh, dependencies. Again, uh, Ulrike already showed this, this very complicated uh, DAG of dependencies, so it, it's good to know which ones are suitable for the um, for inclusion in the uh, in, in in those dependencies, in recommended policy number seven, we ask to provide common uh, files in in the repository, and those files include the the readme file with a brief description, the license file, which contains the full text of, of the license, the support file where we can find uh, the ways to contact the devel development team, and the changelog file that uh, it documents the important changes over time for the for the package. And here in this link at the bottom of the slide, we show uh, what other possible files and more details about those files that can be included in, in the repo and we recommend in this, in this policy. So uh, that was the, the last recommended policy. And now uh, to, to kind of go, uh, go back a, a, a little bit to what uh, Ulrike was talking about, the, 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 the founding of, of XSDK packages, uh, it is actually possible to keep uh, uh, adding, changing, and retiring the community policies, and the process is, is somewhat similar, but more kind of incremental. Um, so we seek, uh, seek feedback from the, from the community, what they like, don't like, or what they still need from the, uh, from the packages. And um, if, the, uh, if the community has, uh, agrees on the input, we, we discuss that feedback and see how, they, how we can incorporate that and then within the team, we actually do a vote and try to reach the consensus of including these new policies or maybe retiring some of them or moving the recommended ones into the, uh, into the mandatory ones. So that, that would be how the processes uh, and the community policies are amended uh, over time. So that ends my, uh, my part of the uh, presentation about the policies. Uh, maybe we can uh, stop by uh, right now and, and see if there are any questions. And if not, I'll uh, move on to Ulrike. There are two questions here, Peter. Okay. So from an ECP, uh, ST software uh, technology, right, perspective, should we be working with our 2.3.n 
SDK to ensure you are meeting the mandatory and the recommended policies, or do we do we work with XSDK directly? Well, so the uh, inclusion in XSDK requires to work with the uh, XSDK team um, uh, directly, and uh, we 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 would uh, we would discuss that on the on the mailing list. So there would be direct contact to us. Now, working of course within uh, internally within the project, that that's kind of uh, outside of our uh, of the scope. So next, the current policy document appears to assume the use of MPI and to be written focused on the requirements of MPI-based packages. Have you considered policies for alternative non-MPI programming models? And then the, the, the remark, ECP is funding several such alternative models. Uh, right, so, uh, so I, I think that uh, we definitely are aware of those and we definitely do discuss those but, uh, but the difference between those alternatives is that uh, the MPI has a, a decades uh, of, of established uh, standardization and implementation process. So it is, uh, it is already very easy to kind of find out what is the accepted use policy of, of MPI. Uh, right now, we did not have any packages that are outside of the MPI trying to join XSDK. So that was not really uh, on the agenda. Okay, so then you can continue, please. Okay, so I'll give it over to Ulrike. Okay, um, okay, I'm back here. So um, just quickly want to mention that there is actually a forum we have where people can show their compatibility with XSDK community policies. I do have the web page down here, so if anybody's interested, since people put down their uh, compatibility, but they also put some notes that can be of interest, especially to, to uh, packages who want to become part of the XSDK or who are just interested in how to implement them. And then um, I do want to talk about the impact of the XSDK software policies. Um, one clear impact we got out of this was um, that we succeeded in improving the code quality as well as the usability of the individual libraries. Um, as you see, as Piotr already mentioned, uh, many libraries um, made changes um, to adjust to those policies to be compatible, which also improved um, their um, qual code quality. Um, for example, there's more testing included now and things like that, or even using log grind things are really helpful. Um, and we, as a matter of fact, we even some application codes uh, came to us and we're trying to um, not become part of the XSTK, of course, but we're trying to um, include the policies um, as far as made sense for them into uh, their codes to improve the quality of their codes. Um, we did address various challenges in interoperability as well as sustainability, um, particularly considering the fact that these Software libraries are developed at very different institutions by different groups, and everybody has a different approach. But there is some conformity because of the um, software policies, while still keeping them unique, each of the individual libraries. Um, we enable the common build of the libraries, which is really helpful. As you see now, we have so many of them, it's really important to be able to do that. Um, and again, this is still the foundation to do further interoperability as well as performance portability. Um, as a matter of fact, um, we are working on increasing interoperability between certain libraries. Um, and uh, again, it will be really important to make this happen by making sure we do have the software policies underneath. Uh, also, the uh, software policies are being looked at by other groups. For example, we have other software development kits, SDKs in ECP, and they are actually looking at the XSDKs to develop their own policies. Again, as I said before, these are math libraries, and what we put in there doesn't necessarily make sense for all the other SDKs. But they have been, it, it's, it's a good thing to look at and take some of them for their own policies. And finally, we are engaging the community. As I said down here, it takes all kinds, and it's really important to get the input. So to finalize this, I just wanted to give you a view at all of them. We didn't want to throw this at you at the beginning because it's a bit overwhelming. Again, the main thing on the slide is up to the right. We do want to have your feedback. We do want to have 
um, any anything we can do to improve things, um, that would be great. We appreciate that. Um, again, this is the short version, so if you do have the slides, it's nice maybe to have them all together on one slide. Um, and that's pretty much it. I just wanted to give you some useful links here, um, which is our XSDK.info webpage, which has all kinds of information on XSDK, as well as the policies and their complete printout. And then there's also, of course, the GitHub version, which gives you the individual policies. And um, there are some other resources which might be helpful, like how-tos. We have various how-to pages here that were developed under the Ideas Project. Um, and finally, the acknowledgments. Thank you very much for attending, and now I leave it open to any further questions. So thank you, Rikas. Thank you, Peter. So I'm, base, I'm gonna take here the, uh, I'm, I'm gonna share my last slide here. Just take over. Just to uh, call participants' attention to, uh, First of all, thank you everybody for joining us today in this webinar. Uh, so again, please give us some feedback by going to that um, uh, survey. Uh, this recording, the recording, the slides, the re slides are already available online. The recording will be available next week and we'll ask the speakers to go through the question and answers and, the, uh, and the, I mean, answer the, the, the questions there. So I'd like to announce that we uh, we are moving then forward to uh, with the uh, the webinar series for the next year, 2020. The next webinar is going to be in about a month, a little more than a month there. And the Exalt team is going to talk about what they have done to greatly improve the performance of their code on a GPU-based uh, architecture. Uh, the, 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 it's going to be presented by Eden Thompson, Stan Moore, and uh, Raul Gayatri. So the event is already online and you can uh, go there and register if you'd like. So thank you very much uh, everybody for joining and with that, uh